So the second in the series on this book, CPH recently published, called Forgiveness. Uh, this is something this woman says, opening paragraph, a quotation from her book. I forgive you, says a father to a gunman who murdered his child in a drive-by shooting. When the father wakes up tomorrow, he will forgive him again and again and again. The truth about forgiveness is that it's not a one-step, one-stop process. The deeper the hurt, the longer the process. And question, do you agree with her that forgiveness is a process? I'm not sure I like the word process. <laughs> Something. I hate that word. Something other than process. Because really, forgiveness is not a process. It takes time. I mean, yeah, the deeper the hurt, the longer it takes really to, to let go. But you know, especially in the hands of God, forgiveness isn't a process. We pray for forgiveness. We expect to be forgiven and it completely, fully, no more problems with God on the spot. And God tells us our forgiveness should imitate his. So I'm just, I'm just not really sure I like the idea of process. And I think well, the second question, is there perhaps a failing to separate forgiveness from feeling? And I think maybe that's what bothers me about that. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is a declaration of being made right with a person, of, of letting go of the past, of not holding something against someone. The feelings associated with that, that may take a long time to come around. But the, mind, the heart has to follow the mind, in, in, especially when forgiveness is concerned. So, yeah, it's not really a process. When you tell somebody you are forgiven, they're forgiven. Not like in degrees. It should be over with them, whatever the issue was. But in your own heart, the feelings associated with that do take time to, to mend. Um, so I, I, it seems to me when she talks forgiveness, she's also talking something about feeling. And I... In, in my book, anyway, I think those two should be separated. Uh, now, Anne, can one, can one forgive and yet still struggle with feelings of unforgiveness? And you know, I, I think certainly so, because we're flesh and blood, after all. We're not divine. So, yeah, the feelings will persist, but forgiveness is a constant putting down of one's own feelings. It's... It's faith triumphing over feelings. Eventually to the point where the feelings are beaten down so much that they, they don't affect how you see that person anymore. But that doesn't mean forgiveness was some kind of process. It means your feelings are some kind of process. Uh, Matthew 16.24. Look that one up, please. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. This applies to, to this discussion on forgiveness in as much as to forgive someone is really a denial of oneself. Denial of one's feelings. And it's a constant denial of oneself. Yeah, you may have every right to be angry, uh, to, to, to keep distance from someone who could potentially hurt you again. But we deny our rights in forgiveness. We, uh, we, we do what's right in God's eyes, even if it's not what is right in our own self-interest. So self-denial and forgiveness go together. Matthew 18, 21-22. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say 
to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And as the handout states, if someone regularly sins against us, human nature is to let feelings stay hurt and withhold forgiveness. Jesus' instruction is to ignore feelings and continue to forgive, as he himself does. And note that Jesus doesn't allow the nature or the size of the sin to be an issue, nor the depths of the hurt feelings. Yeah, really, what the sin is, in Peter's question, what the sin is, is irrelevant. How often should he sin against me, and I forgive him? Uh, and how hurt you were is irrelevant. And, and Jesus' take on it is, you just keep forgiving him. Seven times 70 is his way of saying you constantly forgive. You never not forgive. So does Jesus speak of forgiveness here as a process? And, and, and I'd say no. When you forgive, you forgive, even though your feelings may take a while to come around. Any thoughts? All right, consider Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, 29 to 31. Again, and when you're thinking in terms of forgiving another, a little passage like this takes on a little different meaning. Isaiah 40, 29 to 31, he gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, when we're confronted with somebody who sinned against us greatly and hurt us deeply, we may feel as if we are too weak to just let it go. Yeah, but this is the point of why, why we need church in this whole forgiving scheme of things. Because we are weak. We come here, we get the strength we need. Jesus builds up us to do what by nature we're too weak to do alone. So he gives power to the weak, and that includes power to forgive. And lastly in this section, consider Genesis chapter 50. One of the great forgiveness stories in the Bible. Genesis 50, 15 to 21. Joseph and his brothers. And, and note as we read this, the difference between the way Joseph's brothers understand forgiveness and the way Joseph understands forgiveness. So 50, 15 to 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespasses of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespasses of the servants of the God of your father, and Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for, I, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you, for your little ones, and he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. All right, so Joseph's brothers were operating under the assumption of, of the world. They really messed him up, so he was going to get even with them. Joseph did not, did not think like they did. He had genuinely forgiven them. 
Um, why, why does it say he wept, verse 17, when they spoke to him? What does that indicate? Yeah, he hadn't really sinned. He had nothing to repent of. Could indicate compassion. Yes, he certainly did. What else? Right? He'd been waiting. He had been waiting to hear them ask for forgiveness. It overwhelmed him when they finally did. It certainly indicates the depth of the hurt. Decades, this is decades after the fact. And, and he, had, he had had exposure to them already. He'd met them. He'd, uh, he'd talked with them. He revealed who he was to them. And yet the hurt was all still there. And when they finally come and ask for forgiveness, it just, the emotion of it all was overwhelming. <clears throat> Which again is an indication that the feelings can still be raw and the forgiveness real. Now, Joseph doesn't wait until all his feelings are smoothed out before he announces forgiveness. He forgives them, even in the midst of his struggling feelings. But I'm sure their tears of joy combined with tears of hurt, combined with tears of relief, and, and so many emotions all mixed up in those tears of his. And notice how he lets go of his, his, his right feelings of anger. He had every right to be mad at them. <coughs> Verse 19, don't be afraid, am I in the place of God? And this is, I think, the key to dealing with a severe hurt. That Joseph had turned repayment for this vengeance over to God. Am I in the place of God? He had no intention of, of having vengeance on them for what they had done. He left this in God's hands and knew God would deal with it in his own way. He wasn't going to carry that. And this too, I think, is important. And, and in fact, we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. The idea of vengeance. You, you can't, you can't uh, see forgiveness as something that you will get to eventually after you go through your period of making things right with them. And then when you think you've leveled the playing field, then you forgive. Joseph forgives, and he lets God worry about ideas of how to deal with them and their sin. All right, any thoughts about Joseph's story? Yes. So that helps too. Right? <laughs> Eventually, imagine though. You know, imagine those first years when he wound up in jail, when he wound up getting falsely accused, sitting there stewing, thinking this is all his brother's fault. That would have really, would have really eaten on a guy. But yeah, eventually it does kind of reveal its God's purpose to him. He did. He, he did. You wonder, and I, I think if I was in his shoes, I would wonder what, how sincere are they really? You know, are they asking forgiveness because they're genuinely sorry for what they did? Or are they asking forgiveness because they know I can kill all of them right now? They're scared to death. And they wanted to eat. They wanted to eat. They That's right. They, they had their ulterior motives for being repentant at this stage of the game. But he doesn't, again, the story doesn't show him ever trying to read any of that into it. And he also, and they also said that it was what the father told him to say. Which, really, there's no biblical indication that he actually did. Exactly, they're just trying to protect themselves. Was there something else? Yeah. Well, I was just going to, you said, 
said that, uh, that, that Joseph left it in God's hands and, and left vengeance up to God. And, and what vengeance really requires is, you know, vengeance is based off of a, a record of wrong things. And, mm -hmm. and we're called to, you know, love doesn't keep a record of wrong things. We're called to love. <laughs> yes, very true. Yeah, vengeance requires a record of sin, and we're not supposed to keep tally. Exactly right. I've had I've had situations <clears throat> where, um, in doing in doing reconciliation work with congregations that are especially struggling with their pastor, I've run into situations where members are actually keeping a notebook. A running tally of the sins of the pastors that he's guilty of, anything that made him mad, so that they don't forget. So you have to start by telling him, get rid of that, because that is not, that's not forgiveness, that's not Christian. But uh, it's human nature again to keep that tally. Yeah, the, the Joseph story really is a good story about the nature of forgiveness. And, and I, I, think, I think Joseph's forgiveness probably brought about the brothers' genuine repentance at some point in time. I don't, the, the story kind of indicates that every, everything they do is motivated by self-interest and fear, which really isn't genuine repentance. Never, never do they, well, outside of, outside of the older brother. Is it Simeon, maybe? who does say to them, you know, we brought all this on ourselves. One of them come to terms with it, a handful of them come to terms, but the majority, it really never clearly states that they all came to terms with the horrible thing they did and repented of it. But the, the story more seems to indicate that it's, it's Joseph's forgiving them, even when they're not really truly repentant, that does eventually sway their hearts and bring them back to repentance. And I think that's another important thing about forgiveness. Our forgiving someone can help them come to repentance, even if they are not currently as repentant as they ought to be. Forgiveness is, a, is powerful. All right, next uh, section under the line there. Quote from her book. When you are wronged, you are handed a wound. The larger the pain, the larger the wound. Just because you cannot see internal wounds does not mean you forget they exist. We've heard the phrase, forgive and forget. It's easy to say, but impossible to do. While we may be able to forget small slights, we remember life-altering wounds. Uh, and we should remember, of course, that God, on the other hand, does forget sins, even huge ones. Uh, he says as much in Hebrews chapter 10, if you take a look. You know, it's our flesh that gets in the way of forgiveness because our flesh wants to hang on to things. Hebrews 10, 16 to 18. Uh, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, said the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. And then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So God is able to forget but our sinful flesh can't. Uh, here's again what she says. When someone hands you a wound, you have three main options. One, hand it back. When you hand back a wound, it's called revenge. It looks something like this. You did this to me, then this is what I'll do to you. Whether verbally or physically, handing the wound back through revenge intends harm. Two, internalize or hide it. This happens when shame plays a part in the womb, wound. Rape victims deal with this. Just don't tell anybody about it. Carry it around. It's not just rape victims. I think this happens a lot. <clears throat> a lot between people. Somebody hurts you and you just kind of clam up and keep it to yourself. But you also then consequently stop really talking to them and trying to resolve things. Three, hand it up to Jesus. When we hand our wounds up to Jesus, we take them out of circulation. The wounds don't have the opportunity to fester in us or spread to others. 
And she uses language that, you know, is kind of typical but nebulous, hand it up to Jesus. And as I say on the back of the handout there, how exactly do you hand something up to Jesus? You know, it sounds nice, but how do you actually do that? You know, is simply praying that Jesus help you forgive that person, is that what it is to hand something up to Jesus? Uh, to me, it goes, has to be something deeper than that. I mean, you can pray all day that God help you forgive and those feelings are still there that you've got to fight against. What does handing it to Jesus imply in our actions towards others? And what does it imply about our thoughts? So, all right, so somebody stabs you in the back and slanders you around town, and you want to hand it up to Jesus. So you pray for forgiveness, and then you find yourself in line someplace right next to that person. How are you going to deal with it? So this is what I think handing it up to Jesus is more than prayer. It has to be a willingness to confront the problem and not be ruled by your hurt. So you ignore them. You're standing there in line. You confront them on the spot. Hey, I heard you said this about me. What do you, what do, you do? Talk to them like normal, like nothing happened? <laughs> you want an answer. She's asking you. Yeah, I hear that. There's no sense of putting on a, a fake, a false. You don't want to be phony, smile, and pretend everything is good when it's not. Unless you just turn around and walk away. Yeah, turning around and walking away isn't necessarily a Christian response to our anger either. Say hi and go. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah. Pretend, pretend fixes nothing. Refusing to confront issues also fixes nothing. Um, when I do the reconciliation work, I haven't in quite a while, thank goodness. But when I was, the, the number one problem I would consistently see all the time and, and between members of congregations and between members and the pastor and the pastor himself with the people, the number one problem <clears throat> was not confronting issues having them and just kind of hoping they go away by not saying anything and going on pretending everything is fine when in fact it's not. Never discussing it, never getting it out in the open, just kind of ignoring it. It never goes away when you just ignore it. So somehow or another there has to be a conversation. And it might not go well, but you, you for your part anyway need to have a conversation in such a way that it's Op leaves the door open for reconciliation. If they slam the door, it's on them. But at least approaching it in such a way as, hey, I've, I've heard there are some issues you might want to talk about. And I've done that. I've done that with people that I've heard are slandering me. I've gone to their house, I've knocked on their door, and I said, oh, I understand, I, I, I hear there are some issues that we might have to settle. You know, can we sit down and talk about it? Usually that takes them so off guard that they, uh, that they are willing to talk about it. But I've also had times when I've done that where people have said, you know, I'm never going to talk to you. Well, then it's on them. Uh, but you know, more than just this business is kind of nebulous, evangelical sounding, handed up to Jesus stuff. The reality is, this is a multifaceted thing. You, you pray that God help you forgive. But then you also have to be willing when actually confronted by that person to, to still speak truthfully and yet kindly, to speak in a way that you're leaving the door open to be reconciled to them, uh, but maybe necessarily confronting an issue. You know, I don't know if you understand this or not, but that really hurt. You know, 
that, that was a big deal. You might have said it in jest, maybe you didn't mean it. You know, I'll give you, give you the benefit of the doubt, but you know, you've, you've got to understand that what you said had some impact, or what you did, it, it, uh, it hurt. Let him know, talk about it. Now, is a line the place to do that? Maybe not. You know, maybe if you get in line and you're confronted with somebody in a crowd or something, then the appropriate thing to do is say, hey, can we, can we get together sometime and talk about this? You know, you don't want to make a scene in public. It's best if those things be handled one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they try and make a scene in public. Scene. Right? It's like they do that confronting in a... Right. They, they want <laughs> to make a scene to humiliate you further. Exactly. And to turn the mic just a little... You know, not, not to be so... Right. And I've had that happen too. You know, you know, yeah. And in which case you just... Try and tell them now's not the time or the place. Let's get together. You know, make make them look like the the bully, not you. But responding back in public and drawing everybody into it is never the answer. All right. So this idea of handing it up to Jesus implies in our actions towards others that we actually make a concerted effort to try and be reconciled. But if it's rejected again, that's not on us. And what does imply in our thoughts? Again, it, it means fighting ourselves, that denial thing that we talked about earlier. Forgiveness is not easy. It means fighting against your own feelings that want to stay mad. So you hand it up to Jesus by fighting your own feelings and by making a concerted effort and by prayer. It all kind of goes together as one big thing. And it's a, and it's a very difficult thing. Yes. When, when Jesus was confronted by the devil, the only way he fought him was with God's word. Correct. But he wasn't also trying to be reconciled with the devil, and he wasn't even forgiving the devil. The devil was done. He's judged. But yes, Jesus did confront evil with the word of God, and that's certainly appropriate for us to do at times, too. But... You know, there's a right and a wrong way. Again, I've, I've had situations where I've talked to people, said, have you talked to them about it privately? You know, if you've got a gripe about, about them, have you talked about it? Yes, I have. Okay? How, how did that conversation go? Well, I told him what he had done, you know, and uh, shaking a finger in his face, kind of, I told him. That's not talking to somebody. That's getting in their face and just stirring the pot and making it worse. Confronting a problem does not mean going in and starting another round of fights. It means actually attempting a reconciliation by talking to them as a human being, a, a fellow sinful human being at that. Yeah, they did something horrible against you. Guess what? You've done a lot of horrible things against God and other people too. So, you know, treat them as if they're the same as you, not worse than you. All right? Next section, revenge. And again, this is what she writes. There are two basic types of revenge. A, active revenge. This kind of revenge moves aggressively toward our offenders. Perhaps a family member says something derogatory about your spouse. You immediately take offense and start telling the rest of the family about their many faults, whether secretive or not. Active revenge always hurts far more people than we realize. And passive revenge. This kind of revenge deceptively looks like forgiveness. Passive revenge does not move aggressively toward the offender, but takes the form of withholding cold shoulders or secretly celebrating when something negative happens to them. It is forgiveness lip service, not a genuine movement toward it. And again she writes, revenge assumes God isn't doing enough. When I choose to take revenge, I alone determine the severity of the person's transgression, the proper method of punishment, and the time frame in which it needs to occur. I alone determine that God is not moving fast enough or metting out what I believe is appropriate judgment. And revenge always escalates. An offense can start with something as small as the rolling of the eyes at someone's behavior in a social setting, but it doesn't end with reciprocated rolling eyes. It always escalates. Now look in Judges 15. 
one of the great biblical examples of escalating revenge. Judges 15. Starting right in the beginning of Judges 15. And after a while, in the time of wheat harvest, it happened that Samson visited his wife with a young goat, and he said, Let me go into my wife into her room, but her father would not permit him to go in. Her father said, I really thought that you thoroughly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister better than she? Please take her instead. And Samson said to them, This time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. Then Samson went and caught 300 foxes, and he took torches, turned the foxes tail to tail, and put a torch between each pair of tails. When he had set the torches on fire, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and burned up both the shocks and the standing grain, as well as the vineyards and olive groves. Then the Philistines said, Who's done this? And they answered, Samson, son-in-law of Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. So the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. And Samson said to them, Since you would do a thing like this, I will surely take revenge on you, and after that I will cease. So he attacked them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt in the cleft of the rock of Etam. Now the Philistines went up and camped in Judah and deployed themselves against Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? So they answered, We've come up to arrest Samson and to do to him as he's done to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? What is this you've done to us? And he said to them, As they did to me, so I've done to them. And they said to him, We've come down to arrest you, that we may deliver you into the hand of the Philistines. And Samson said to them, Swear to me that you will not kill me yourselves. So they spoke to him, saying, No, but we will tie you securely and deliver you into their hand, and we will surely not kill you. And they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. Then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that's burned with fire, and his bonds broke loose from his hands. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand and took it, and killed a thousand men with it. And Samson said, with a jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with a jawbone of a donkey, I've slain a thousand men. And so it was when he had finished speaking that he threw the jawbone from his hand and called that place ramath Lehi. All right, so <laughs> there's escalation for you. So what starts it off? A stupid father-in-law who gives his wife, evidently, actually, it starts back earlier now. What started it off seems to be Samson wasn't treating his wife very well. Because the father-in-law comes to the conclusion that you must hate my, my daughter and not want anything to do with her. So Samson must not have been a very good husband. He's probably to blame for, for this originally. Father-in-law gives her away to somebody else, and Samson goes nuts. He doesn't just, just have revenge on the father-in-law. He takes revenge out on the entire nation of the Philistines. You know, and, then, and then they do something back to him. They kill the father-in-law and his wife. So he kills a bunch of them. They go to arrest him and kill him. He kills a bunch more of them. It just... It's just one thing after another and this huge escalation until by the end of it all, there's a thousand, probably in excess of a thousand men dead. Because there were a thousand dead just with the jawbone of a donkey episode. He had killed more before then. Uh, so, was he justified doing what he did? First of all, was Samson's revenge proportional to the sin against him? And this, this is what she was saying about revenge escalates things. No. You know, it really wasn't proportional. Was he justified doing what he did? Here's the curious thing. Purely, from a Christian point of view, absolutely not. 
But God doesn't really punish him for this. In, in fact, when Samson gets thirsty at the very last verses of this chapter, God splits a rock open to give him, give him something to drink. So God doesn't punish. Why doesn't God punish Samson for just wiping out over a thousand people? These were Philistines. God had actually commanded Israel to wipe out all of the occupying nations in the promised land. Israel had failed to do that. Samson, in a, in a kind of backwards kind of way, was actually fulfilling God's will by wiping out the enemies of God, which is something he wanted all of his children to do earlier that they failed to do. You know, it's, This isn't a normal revenge story in as much as Samson was supposed to be doing this to God's enemies. But clearly, from a, from a Christian point of view and a human point of view, this is revenge gone wrong. Jesus on revenge. Matthew 5, 38 to 42. Matthew 5, 38 to 42, You have heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other cheek to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him two. Give to him who asks you. From him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You have said it heard, you have, excuse me, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. There's Jesus on revenge. That's a hard one. Yes, it is. All of this is hard. Forgiveness is hard. It's completely contrary to our human nature. It's, a, it's an act of extreme self-denial. Romans 12, 17 to 21, Paul on revenge. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. Give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Again, forgiveness is something more than a letting go of something, but forgiveness as an active role in trying to do something positive for the very person who's hurt you. Again, this is totally contrary to human nature and human thought. So the state of the heart coincides with actual actions. It's not just a matter of feeling, and it may be even counter to feelings. All right, any thoughts, comments, or questions? Good, then let's close there with prayer. Gracious Savior, we thank you that you have forgiven us all our sins and do so every day. And through that forgiveness, we pray that you might give us strength to forgive those who have offended us. Help us put away the hurt and help us reflect your love to us in all we do for Jesus' sake. Amen.